right, let's get started. All right, um, DJ Drop Tables is back. Thank you. Uh, did you solve all your problems? Uh, yeah, most of them. I mean, uh, yeah, girlfriend number two. You know, we had a, we had a little we had a little pregnancy scare, but uh, oh. yeah, turns out it was just Stabby Steve's. So, okay, yeah, good. We, we're all good. Yeah, you don't you don't want to be in that boat. It's awful. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Everything else okay? Uh, yeah. I mean, are you still gonna have three girlfriends, or are you gonna try to cut back? Yeah, I'm gonna cut back. Just probably like one and a half. Probably. One and a half. Yeah. What's the half? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Uh, so we have a lot to think, a lot of things to talk about today. Um, so real quickly before we get into the course, the, the the topic for the lecture today. So this is the final docket for everyone uh, this semester. This is everything that 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 you have to finish up. Project three obviously was due last night. Homework five should go out today-ish, um, and that'll be due uh, in two weeks on December third. Project four will go out went out this weekend. And that'll be due on December 10th. Um, the extra credit is due on December 10th as well. And then we'll have the, the checkpoint, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And then the final exam is on Monday, December 9th at 5.30 PM. Not in this room. I don't know what room they'll put us in. Uh, but it's sort of a shitty time. Um, so maybe we'll do, instead of doing candy, maybe we can do pizza or something like that, something better. OK? So any questions about any of these things? All right, and then some other things that are floating around. Uh, we have three more sort of, I'm gonna call them real lectures, but like course topic lectures on, uh, on, on material. That's this week and then one, one class next week. And then when we come back from after the Thanksgiving break on Monday, December 2nd, our friends at Oracle will be coming giving a talk about uh, the, the stuff that they're working on. And again, this is not like a, um, it's not like a lecture where they're, they're, you know, instead of me talking about the material, they're going to talk about the same material. They're actually going to talk about what they've been building uh, in, in their group, and you'll see how it ties in together all the th various things we talked about through the entire semester. The other thing that, the other, for the second class in the last week, uh, I do two things. One will do a final system review, and the second one will be what I'll call a systems potpourri, where if there's any system you want me to talk about for like 10 or 15 minutes to teach you about what it is, how it works, and why it's interesting, you know, and using the vernacular that we talked about through the entire semester, we'll have a vote online at this URL, it's just a Google form, and you go select whatever system that you want me to cover for 10 or 15 minutes, okay? So we usually have time to do uh, three or four of them. So the list that I'm showing here is the, when you go to the, the Google form, it's the, uh, it's the systems on the dbd, dbdb.io website that have had the most views for the last two months. Um, so that they're in that order, but you don't necessarily have to you know, follow that. But and also, there's another one that's on dbdb.io that we want to cover that I, that's not on that list. Just, you know, that you, you can type it in, OK? And you can go back last year and see what I cover, but I encourage you not to do that before you vote, because you don't want to sort of uh, taint your, your, your bias to you just do whatever people did last year. Because I'm always curious to see what you guys are interested about. Like, you know, we covered Postgres a little bit. We covered MySQL, Oracle, and SQLite a little bit. Uh, be interested to see what you guys are seeing on the internet, or what you want to do in, in at your job, or on a hobby project. We you know what system you, you've been thinking about maybe using, and I can come teach you about what it is and how it works. Okay. All right, and then the the extra credit feedback. Again, you can submit your extra credit article next uh, this Sunday on November 24th. And then the, myself and the TAs will give you feedback and say what you're doing correctly, what you're not doing correctly. Um, and that way you can fix it up in time for the, the submission so, so that you get full credit. OK? Any questions about any of these things? So I'll put a deadline for when you should go vote, right? If it, like, you obviously can't vote the day before the lecture because then I don't have time to actually prepare it. So it'll be maybe the, the, the week, week of Thanksgiving will be the deadline for this. OK? All right, and the last thing is that uh, in addition to giving an in-class lecture, uh, on on the the second, that should be the December third. On the th Tuesday, December third, Oracle will also be giving a graduate level uh, research talk uh, over in the PDL in the CIC building. I think they're also giving an undergrad talk uh, Monday Monday afternoon as well. So there's be three Oracle talks in two days. That you know, one of them you're, you're required to come to, or not required, but you'll get extra credit for for the final if you come to that. And then these two additional ones are optional. Okay. Any questions?
We're almost done. All right. So today's class is now the beginning for our discussion on distributed databases. And as I said last class, we can't actually, you know, before we just you know, jump immediately into distributed databases, we had to spend however weeks we've gone so far in this semester to understand how a single node database system works. Because when now we start going distributed, you know, just because we have more machines or more hardware doesn't magically make our system easier to build or better. Right? All the things that we had to talk about for a single node system, we have to still solve them in a distributed system. And actually, they're even harder because now you have to account for the network. So we've already talked about this before when we talked about query execution, this, this contrast between a parallel database and, and a distributed database system. And when I talk about parallel database system, we were just assuming that the, the, the database system was running on a single box that could have multiple cores and multiple CPUs. Uh, and then we assumed that the, the workers that were executing the queries could communicate very quickly with each other. And that communication was reliable. Because like if you're running on the same physical machine, you're just sending things over the interconnect between CPU sockets. That's super fast. But now in a distributed database system, we still have to, you know, there's still the things we care about how to do parallel execution, but now we're, we're doing this potentially across multiple machines. And so now we actually need to be, be, be mindful of what, it, what it, the cost is and the reliability of one worker communicating with another worker. Because if it's going over the network, that, you know, that other worker might not be in the same data center, right? And might not even be on the same continent. And so now we can't assume that, you know, we send a message, they're guaranteed to get that. And that's going to come, become problematic when we start talking about transactions and other things. So as I said, the, the, the for the distributed database stuff we're going to talk about starting today, it's, it's building on all the things we've already talked about. So we still have to do logging. We still have to do uh, concurrent control. We have to do query optimization. We have to do query execution. We have to do joins, potentially. All those things we still have to do in a distributed database. And now just, everything's more expensive. Everything is harder. So for today's lecture, as I said, today's sort of introduction to distributed databases, just to understand uh, you know, what, what they actually look like, the different designs of them, what are the implications of those, those designs. And then we'll talk about how to do partitioning, which is the, the key way we're going to divide up our, our database across multiple resources to get the parallelism we want in a distributed environment. And then we'll finish up briefly touching on how, how hard distributed concurrence control is. And then that'll segue into Wednesday's class where we'll spend the entire day talking about how we actually do this. And again, like we're still going to do two-phase locking potentially. We're still going to do timestamp ordering. All those things we did on a single node system still apply here. Just now it's distributed, so it's even harder. Okay? And again, stop and ask questions as we go along. So the first thing we need to discuss is what is the system architecture of the database system? So as I said before, when we talked about parallel systems, we talked about there being, there, there, there being these uh, workers that are typically tied to either a, pr a process or a thread that are running on the CPU, and they're going to access shared resources like disk and memory. And so the design of our, of our database system in, in a distributed environment, depending what our architecture is, right, the, the variations of these architectures are, are going to differ in how you actually can coordinate the CPUs and communicate with each other as you're running queries or transactions in parallel. And where, are, where is the memory and where is the disk located in context to, to, to the CPUs? So what we've talked about so far in the entire semester is what is known as a shared everything system. Assume this is a single box, a single rack unit that has CPU and CPU has local memory and, mem and you know, there's a local disk that you can read and write to. Right? And anytime I want to access something in, in the von Neumann architecture that we're, we're based on, anytime I want to get something from disk, I got to bring it into my buffer pool, into memory, and then my worker up above running on my CPU can, can read and write to things, read and write to pages, and then I eventually write them out to disk. And again, most database minute systems, that, that, well, every database system that's not distributed is using this approach, is a shared everything system. So an alternative in a distributed environment is, one alternative is called shared memory. And the idea here is that you're going to have multiple CPU resources that are potentially running on different machines, but there's, there's a communication layer that allows them to have a unified memory view across all of those machines. 
I right, assume this is some kind of high, high speed interconnect like InfiniBand or TCP IP. It doesn't matter. The high level architecture is still the same. And then there's still going to be some, some local, or sorry, some shared disk that everybody's reading writing to. Right, so typically, uh, the spoiler be, this is actually not, actually, I don't know of any database system actually that's commercially or open source that actually uses this. This kind of architecture is mostly seen in the HPC or high performance computing world. Like the people running on supercomputers at like the, the big national labs, they, they build software in, in assuming this model. For databases, there, there isn't that much. Another approach is to do shared disk. And the idea here is that the CPU workers, or the workers running on the CPU, they have local memory. Um, but the, the disk where we have maintain the persistent state of the database, that's uh, some kind of shared architecture, sh shared device that all these CPUs can, can read and write into. Right, so think of this if you're running on Amazon. This is something like S3 or EBS. Uh, or HDFS, like any kind of distributed file system. So all the, the CPUs are still seeing the same, same disk, uh, but in order for them to communicate with each other, they have to maybe send messages back and forth between them. Right? Because they, they, you know, this CPU can't read the memory of this CPU. The last architecture is what most people think of when they think of a distributed database, which is what is known as shared nothing. Meaning every single worker is running on, on, a, on a sort of island by itself, it has its own local memory, has its own local disk. And the only way to coordinate between different workers is to go up above and communicate at, you know, using some kind of uh, message fabric on the top. So again, this CPU worker here can't read the memory or disk from any of its, any of its neighbors or friends in the cluster. So again, we'll go through each of these one by one. So again, under shared memory, as I said, this is not that common. Uh, in databases, I, I'm not aware of any system that's actually people are using that's based on this. Uh, and the basic idea is that the, the database system sort of is running on these different CPUs. It's running in the same operating system instance. Right? And it assumes it has a single global address space that may be disaggregated across different machines. Um, and then there's some networking layer that allows them to pass messages back and forth to make, make this work. Right? So again, this could be InfiniBand, this could be TCP IP, this could be Intel's OmniPath, right? some fast interconnect uh, between them. So in this, in, in this world, the, the database instance running on one CPU, like the worker is aware of other workers. And so if they want to communicate between each other, they can just do what you would normally do in a shared everything system. You can just write something into a global data structure or send a message over, over an IPC, and you know, the, the other process or the other worker running on, on, the other, on another machine would see that. Right? Again, think of the context of a shared everything system. When we were doing two-phase locking, if we wanted to tell another worker that, hey, I hold the lock for this tuple, I add an entry to my lock table that's sitting in memory. So same thing here. If I, one worker wants to up, acquire a lock on a tuple, just updates the global lock table, and then the, the messaging fabric is guaranteed to make sure everything's coherent across all those, all those workers. And again, as I said, this, this is not that common. I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody actually does this. The more common one is shared disk. And again, the idea here is that we have these compute nodes that have uh, their, their own local memory. They can have a disk up there as well, but that's not the, the, the final storage location of any kind of data in the database. You can just use it for caching in case you need to spill the disk on your local machine. But the database, the final resting, lo resting location is down here. So if I say, I bring a, a page into my buffer pool in my local memory, say I modify it, and then I'm going to write it out because it's dirty, I would write it down here to the shared disk. And now, potentially, any other worker can, can see my change. But how you coordinate that, we'll, uh, make sure that they're told about that change, we'll get, we'll get to later. So as I said, this is, the, this is the prevalent architecture in today's cloud environment because the disk is going to be you know, some, something Amazon provides you, like S3 EBS. So pretty much every sort of cloud native database system that you've heard about is, is going to be running this environment. Because one big advantage you can get is that you're able to scale up the compute resources and the disk resources separately because the compute resources are stateless. The state of the database is down here. So if these, all of these compute resources crash and go away, 
my, you know, assuming I've, I've, you know, I've logged things out correctly, everything is, is still here. And then I can just bring up another instance and, and pick up where the other guys left off. We'll see in a second that's not so easy to do in a, uh, in a shared nothing environment because it, every, node, every node holds state. So let's look at a high-level example like this. Again, so we have our application server. It's going to send requests to uh, these front-end compute nodes. Right? This is where we have the, the, the workers running on the CPUs and their local memory. And then we have some back-end uh, storage, storage device that everyone can, can read and write to. So let's say that the application says, I want to get uh, record 101. It goes to this node. How, how, it knows to go, how, it, how it, the application knows to go to this node, we'll cover in a second, but assume it does. So then this says some kind of lookup that says, well, record 101, if I look at my index, I see that it's in page ABC. So I go to my shared disk storage and I say, get, get me page ABC. And I bring that to my buffer pool. Same thing, this guy wants 200. He doesn't have it in its buffer pool. So it goes out the disk and, and fetches it in. So now if I want to scale up on um, compute resources, because the, again, the state of the database is always here on, on shared disk, I can just bring up a new guy here I don't have to copy anything immediately because if I now request, say, 101, same thing. I just go to the disk and bring it back to my buffer pool. And I, I can serve the request. Tricky. Sorry, yes. How does the lock manager work in a setting like this? His question is, how does a lock manager work in a setting like this? And, and th th we'll cover this. Yes. Not yet. So we're just simplicity. We're talking about how do we, how we get things in now. Yeah. Yeah, so his question is, in a shared memory architecture, how is that different than a multi, multi socket, multi processor shared everything system? They're the same. But think of, so there are, um, there are, there are, uh, there are distributed systems that have a unified memory across multiple physical machines. So each machine has its own motherboard, has its own like physical you know, physical memory that it can read write to, but there's a there's a layer that it says all the processors think they have this one giant block of memory. Nobody does that for databases. You see that in the HPC world, like all those people are doing like nuclear bomb or particle physics simulations. They're writing those four chan programs, assuming they have this like you know terabytes of of, of memory across multiple machines they they can do computation on. Yes. Uh, for a system like this. Uh you know, companies, does it mean that companies like uh, Oracle, you know, they have like just one data center because of the shared? So his question is, uh, if you assume in a shared disk architecture like this, if, if, if a database vendor, database system vendor is using a shared disk architecture, does that mean that they either have to have all the, the, the data for a database in one location? No. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But again, I mean, think about this. There's an abstraction between the physical and, and uh, the physical location and the logical location of, of the disk. These guys don't know anything about where these things are, right? So like, it just says, hey, here's this file I can, I can read and write to, just as you would as, a, as if it was a local disk. Or in the case of Amazon or, or, or Azure, you get like a, like a block-based or object-based API. Give me this bucket, give me that bucket. That, that's sending like a REST request to go to some backend service. You don't know where that data actually is. So doesn't that mean it's similar compared to when, uh, you know, compared to between the application layer server and the nodes? So application server doesn't know which node it, it, it. Yeah, so he, yeah, so we'll get to that as well. So his question is, in my example here, when I'm sending this request, in this, in this example here, I, this, the application it says, I'm going to this node to get this record. You could have something in front of this that could hide that, or this thing could maintain to say where to go get the thing I need. We'll come to that. The, the, the thing I'm going to focus on here is like, is like, this guy has no state of the database other than what's in its buffer pool. But that's not considered to be, that's not considered to be you know, durable or persistent. It's ephemeral. So this guy crashes. Anything we had in here goes away. All right, so now the tricky thing is going to be if I do an update, right? So I update page 101, or sorry, an ID, a record of 101. I have to update page ABC. 
These guys all read that same record. They have page ABC in their buffer pool, but they're not going to know about the, the chains because these shared disk architectures, they don't provide a notification say, hey, by the way, somebody updated this. So I have to have additional messages in, my, on the, in these nodes and say, hey, I think you have page ABC. By the way, I just modified it, and here's the latest version. Or if you ever want to find out what the latest version is, come ask me about it. So that's all the stuff that we have to build in our database system, right? This is just reading, writing to some disk. And so related to his question, it, it, it's all transparent. So right now I'm showing the database in this, in this, in this diagram is on two disks, but I can easily add a bunch more to now split up the data across more disks. So I'm getting better parallelism, better, better replication, better reliability. But none of these guys in the, in, in the, in the compute layer, they don't know anything about that because that's all hidden from me. So you have this nice separation where you can scale things out independently, but you're going to pay a penalty in terms of uh, locality of access because I can't, for the most part, I can't run queries over here. S3 allows you to do some basic filtering, but if anything like a join, I have to do over here. So it means I have to pool the data to my compute nodes. Yes? So this is different from sharding, right? Because like you just said that any of them can have page ABC. Like in sharding, you assume that so, yeah, so, so his question is, this is different than sharding or partitioning, where you have explicit divisions of who has what data. We'll get to that. I'm just showing you what shared disk is at, at a high level. You can still partition at this level. There's nothing about shared disk that precludes you from doing partitioning at the compute level. Because you said that page ABC can, like, can be with other nodes also. Correct. If, if you're not doing partitioning. I think the question is, in this example here, I said, when I update uh, page ABC in this node, it sent a message to the other guys to, to update them and say, hey, I haven't made a change. Is it always like this, or what, what was the alternative? Um, maybe in storage. Yeah, so, so, yeah. So, so what I said in this case here, I update a page ABC. It has to, the, the compute node at the top has to update these compute nodes at the bottom. An alternative would be a way to do a push notification and say, hey, I just got an update ABC. By the way, everybody needs to update, refresh themselves. I'm not aware of any shared disk architecture, like EBS, S3, uh, whatever the Azure stuff. They don't do that because that would be super expensive. Because if you think about it, it's like a pub sub system. I need to know who needs to know about my change because otherwise I'm sending messages that, that are wasteful. So as far as I know, nobody actually does this. You have to coordinate at this layer here. And this is the database system does this. The, the distributed file system or the object store doesn't do that. Yes? But here, are we assuming that the communication between the nodes is reliable enough and fast enough? His, his question is, are we assuming here that the notification is reliable enough or fast enough? No. I didn't say what this is. I didn't say how we're doing. I'm just saying that you have to do this. Can't you run into issues like stale reads? His question is, can't you run into issues with stale reads? Absolutely, yes. That's, that's concurrent control. We'll get there. Yes? Okay, so the, the, again, the, the, the pilot most people think about when they think about distributed databases is the shared nothing architecture, where you have each node has its own local disk, and own lo local memory, and the only way for me to coordinate as I run, run queries is to communicate directly between my nodes. So if I want to get data, if a query shows up that needs to access data on another machine, I can't go to disk and get the shared disk and get it because that doesn't exist. I can't read the memory from, from the other guy because I can't do that. I have to send a message and say, hey, I think you have this data. Either run this query for me and give me back the result or send me that data. And then now you get the issue of like who should have what copy of what data, right? We'll get there. So this is going to be the most hardest architecture to increase capacity and ensure consistency. That's the stale read issue that he talked about because I need to be able to run the system and, and move data around in, in, in a way where I, I'm not losing things. I'm not having false negatives or false positives as I execute queries. Right? Otherwise, I shut the whole system down, then move data around and add new capacity. Uh, but I don't want to do that because I want my system to always be online. So now you say, well, that, this sounds hard. Why would I want to do this? Well, the advantage you're going to get over a shared disk system 
is that you're going to get better performance and better efficiency if the system is, is, is written correctly. Because I can now be mindful of the locality of data and try to move the least amount of data over the network as much as possible. Yes? When you say architecture, I think that's like really depends on your, like, if you're sharding or you're pretty well. Because like if, you, if you have share nothing and you just basically partition everything into different machines, then you don't really have a problem of consistency. Yes, you do. I mean, it's not, it's not the same, 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 it's not a single node, but it's not across the network. C correct. So, so now, now, so his statement is, if you assume that uh, your, 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 your distributed database is partitioned, which we'll get to in a second, um, if now I need to add an, a, a new partition and I need to re potentially reshuffle data, depending on how I'm doing partitioning, I may have to move the whole database, I may have to move, move a segment of it, but again, I don't want to have to stop the world while I move that. And so depending on how much data I have in a single node, and I'm going with a network to some other machine, where's that machine? How long does that take? Right? It's, if I'm doing this, if I don't care about consistency, which we haven't talked about yet, then who cares? Just move data around, and if, if, you, if, you, if you miss a read, whatever. But if I do care, and I am running transactions, then I need to be very careful about how I do this. And people get burned by this a lot. So as I said, this is just a, a brief uh, smattering of, or a, 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 a very limited subset of the, some of the, the shared nothing distributed data systems that, that are out there. Uh, mo again, most of the time for the NoSQL systems that came around maybe 10 years ago, they're all, they're all considered shared nothing. So let's look at how this works. Again, so no longer we have a shared disk. On every single node, we have, a, uh, we have the CPU workers, we have our local memory, we have our local disk. And then now what I'm showing is we partitioned the database or sharded the database into subsets such that each node has some portion of, of the database. And so now I have explicit information about what data I'm having, I have at each node. So now the application says, well, if I want to get ID equal 200, it has to know that this node has, has the, the data that it needs. So go ahead and get that. And again, now this is operating at the same single node, shared everything data as we had before. Like I, it's, it's not my buffer pool, I go to disk, bring it in, and then do whatever it is that I want to do to answer the query and return results. So if all your queries are accessing a, a single node, this, this is super fast. Because again, this is just a single node database system. The tricky thing is then when you start touching data that's across multiple machines. So let's say I have a transaction that says once get ID 10 and get ID equal 200, like a single query wants to do this. So now I need to somehow get that data that this other guy has up here. But what am I sending? Am I sending the request to run the query? Or am I just asking this guy, hey, I know you have this piece of data, send it up to me and I'll run the query up here. Right, that, that can vary. Now in terms of the, the, the scale out issue, right, on the, the shared disk architecture, I just bring up a new compute node. Every compute node is stateless. So therefore, I, it comes along and start executing queries and brings things from the backend shared disk into its buffer pool as needed. But now in a shared nothing architecture, if I have to say bring up a new node, it now needs to get some portion of the database from these other nodes here so that I balance things out. Right? So let's say that this guy is going to send it, you know, uh, uh, some, some number tuples from this, guy, from this bottom partition. The other guy here is going to send some number tuples of this other partition. And then once I know I've copied the data, now I update some global state to say, all right, well, this node is now responsible for the range 101 to 200. This guy is 201 to 300. The guy up above is 1 to 100. And I was saying to his point, like, this, is, this would be hard to do if I care about transactions and I don't want to lose any data because I don't want to have a query show up that maybe that wants to access uh, ID equal 150, and I land here, and the, the data hasn't been transferred yet, so maybe I can answer, but maybe it has been transferred yet, and I go here, and it says I don't have that data anymore, so it returns back nothing, even though it exists at this node down here. So how to, how to actually do this in a transactionally safe manner is, is tricky and not, not easy to do. Yes, in the back. His question is, uh, his question is, how often do you have to scale capacity? 
Couldn't I shut the database down once a month and add new nodes? But what if I want to go the other way? Right. So, so let's say it's Singles Day or Black, or Black Friday or Cyber Monday. It's the one day of the year where like, I have a huge spike. That one I can plan. I, I know it's coming so I can prepare ahead of time. But let's say I have like a flash mob, right? Everybody wants DJ Drop Table's new album all of a sudden. So all of a sudden we have a huge spike in traffic that's unexpected. I want to be able to scale up without having to shut everything down and scale up gradually. The, the, the older systems will do exactly what you're saying. Anytime you see any kind of financial website that says we're down you know, Sunday at 3 a.m., they're probably, I mean, they're may, probably not running a distributed system, but they, they're moving data around and doing maintenance things. But if you're an online website, you can't do that. Yes? Your question is, uh, what's the advantage of doing this versus having a single node with like, like, you know, instead of having two nodes run these two, hold these two partitions, what if you have a single node and you say, well, this CPU socket has this disk and this memory to run this partition, and then another socket has this memory and this disk? Um, that, is that what you're asking? All right, so her question, yeah. Instead of having two separate machines uh, that have you know, disk, memory, and a CPU, what if I had one machine that just had the same amount of resources that I had split across two machines, but now in you know, a single unit? So the question is, what are the, what are the advantages of doing distributed database? So one is, if... Uh, The, you get diminishing returns as you scale up hardware vertically. So there's horizontal, rep, horizontal scalability is, is adding new machines. Vertical scalability is to take my one machine and adding more resources to make it more powerful. Going vertically is way more expensive, usually, uh, and you get diminishing returns. And there's obviously an upper, upper bound of how, how big you can make the machine, right? Let me, give, let, me, let me give one example. In the early days when I was in grad school, uh, we visited PayPal because PayPal was running Oracle. Uh, and they were freaking out that because every Christmas they would, they would hit the, they were running Oracle on a, on a single machine. They bought the most expensive machine you could buy from IBM, right? And you have to buy two of them because you need a hot standby, right? So the, every, every, every holiday season, they were freaking out because that Oracle machine was, was, was hitting the, you know, the, the limit of what the hardware can do. And they couldn't buy a more expensive machine. Right? So they couldn't scale any, any more vertically. So they were mainly moving portions of the database off. Like the humans are moving the portions of the database off in like November to these separate machines on the side just to get through the holidays and then, then they moved it all back. So in that environment, if they had a distributed database system with cheaper machines, then they say, oh, the holiday's coming up. Let me just buy or turn on a bunch, bunch of new machines and have the system scale out that way, handle my high demand, then when the demand goes down, I can start turning them off and, and coalesce into smaller number machines. Your question is, is the, so is the, is the advantage of a distributed versus Scaling horizontally versus scaling vertically is the advantage that you can scale out much more cheaply horizontally. Vert Correct, but there's there's trade-offs, right? Like as we'll see as we talk about how we actually manage a distributed database system, communication is now more expensive. I can definitely run faster if I'm on a single node because I don't need to coordinate between other different nodes and send messages over the network. But as I said, like you you can start to hit scalability bottlenecks, right? Um, the, the trend in data systems up until the 90s was to always scale vertically. The trend now is to scale horizontally because it's just, it's, it's considered, you get better performance and for, for the, getting the better performance, you pay less, you pay less. Is that always true? Yeah, I think that's, that's conventional wisdom. That's always true. Yes. Like, isn't it also better for a disaster if electricity goes off, then if you have only one machine, then everything goes off. But if you have... His statement is, like, a, um, isn't it better for a disaster uh, because, well, again, if, if you're running, like, a $5 million machine from IBM, 
you're not just plugging into the wall outlet, right? You have, you have generators, you have backup power, right? Uh, but I would say that the issue really would be the network gets severed, right? If, if you're, if you, the, the network to the machine, even then, even then you'll still have redundant uh, NICs going into it. But even then, if, if you can't communicate the database, potentially on how you design your distributed database system, you could have the database spread across different data centers, and then you could still be available. We'll discuss more of this on um, on, on Wednesday. But this is this is this is one of the trade-offs you get between the NoSQL guys versus the traditional or new SQL or, or relational database systems. The NoSQL guys were caring about availability. So they, no matter what, they wanted the website to be online and available. And so in exchange, they would give up transactions to make that happen. Because if, if you have to have new transactions, then that, the, the communication is more expensive. You need to make sure that everybody is, is up in order to make changes. And, and, and they argued that was, that was less than ideal. For some applications, I think that makes sense. For, for anything financial, that doesn't make sense. All right, we'll, we'll cover that next class. OK. So distributed databases are old. Uh, some of the first ones were built in the, in the late 1970s. Muffin was uh, created by one of my advisors, Mike Stonebreaker, the guy who built Postgres and Ingress and Vertica and VoltDB. Uh, he had a system called Muffin that was a distributed version of, of Ingress. SDD1 was a, I actually thought it was actually a real system. It turns out it was just a prototype. They actually never actually had anything running. But there's a lot of seminal papers in the late 70s written by Phil, the, the great Phil Bernstein on, uh, on how to build a distributed database and do transactions across them. A lot of the transactional theory that we talk about in this class, right, all that early work was done by Phil. Um, System R Star was a research project out of IBM that was the distributed version of, of, uh, of System R. That never became a product, although there is a distributed version of DB2 today. Gamma was an influential system out of Wisconsin by Dave DeWitt that was one of the first like uh, high performance distributed database systems. And then nonstop SQL of all of these is the only was the only commercial distributed database system, and that was uh, that was helped build or Jim Gray helped build this. Jim Gray was the guy who was at IBM invented like two phase locking and a lot of the early stuff that we talked about under System R. So nonstop was an interesting uh, company. They originally were selling these like super fault tolerant machines, like think of like redundant hardware, like space shuttle level redundancy. Like you have four CPUs running and if one goes down, the other three can keep on running. So they would sell a database system that, that would sort of built on this architecture. Um, it's still around today. A lot of financial systems actually still, still, still use this. Um, and it's, it's amazing how long it still runs. I guess it's nonstop, right? All right, so, uh, all right, so now, we, now that we understand the, the, what the architecture looks like, a lot of you have these questions that like, hey, how is this thing actually going to work? How do we actually find data? How do we actually make sure that everything's consistent? So all of these things we need to be mindful of now when we, when we build our distributed data system. And there's trade-offs because we're not going to be able to do everything. So we're not going to have our system to be guaranteed online all the time and make sure that we always support transactions and, and not lose any data or have in inconsistent results. So as we go along, uh, we'll see what these trade-offs are and why you're not going to be able to achieve everything. The other big question we're going to have is how we actually execute the queries on this distributed data. And so I showed two examples so far. I showed the example on shared disk where the compute nodes pull the data from the shared disk system into their local memory and compute the, compute the result. And then in the case of the uh, shared nothing system, we would send the query to where the data was located, run that locally, and then get back the result. So there's a trade-off between how you actually want to, whether you're doing a push or, or a pull. So the last thing to talk about, too, is what does the architecture look like in terms of what are the nodes doing in the cluster for the distributed database? And there's, base, there's, you know, there's just two approaches. You either have a homogeneous cluster or a heterogeneous cluster. So in a homogeneous cluster, every single node in, in the database cluster is can perform every single kind of task you'd ever have. So I mean, like you could send a query to any single node, and that node will figure out how to, to, to get the result that you're looking for. And they're all going to be doing you know, potentially background tasks and, and other things. So the advantage of this approach is that it makes provisioning and failover 
potentially easier to handle and support because now I just add new nodes and as long as I'm, you know, I, I can move data around safely, I can add new nodes and just, you know, the, the system gets, gets stronger or gets better. In a, uh, up until a point, which we'll, we'll, see, we'll see next class. Another approach is to do heterogeneous, heterogeneous cluster where you're gonna have specific nodes or, or members of the, of the database system be responsible for separate tasks. And so now I have to make a decision, say if I'm running, my system is running slower, I want to add new nodes, I have to know whether I should add a node for this type of, of, of node or this other class of node, right? I have to make a decision at, at, that, at that level. So give me an example of, what, uh, of, 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 of one of these architectures. I always like to use MongoDB because that's the most, uh, most sort of basic one to understand. So MongoDB uses what is, is known as a heterogeneous cluster architecture. So you have, you have special purpose nodes that are responsible for doing specific tasks in, in the system. So when the application wants to send a request or execute a query, it always goes to this router. And, and so the router looks at the, the request and says, you know, I want to look at, I want to get record with ID equal 101. These guys are stateless. They don't know about what any of the data is on the actual shards. So it goes to this config server node that it's responsible for spending, sending, sending out back the information about where to find data on these different uh, partitions or these shards here. So that's all this thing does. This thing is responsible is like a, a global state for what the, the configuration of the system is. So now the router use, gets this routing table from the config server and then it can send the request to uh, the MongoD or the shard server. And then that's where it actually executes, executes the query and get, gets back the result. So under this architecture, again, if, if I notice that, oh, my, my router uh, infrastructure is my bottleneck, then I can scale this thing out and add more new nodes without touching the config server or the, or the, the, the sharded servers. Yes? Can you give an example of what you mean by a task? His question is, what, what's an example of a task? So like garbage collection, we talked about MVCC or building indexes or uh, moving data around because I'm, 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 I'm scaling up or scaling down. Again, like you can't send a query to this guy here. He can, he can only tell you what the configuration of the system looks like. And this guy can't hold any data. He can only tell you how to send your, you know, where to send your, your query. So the other thing we, we sort of briefly touched upon is about this notion of data transparency in a distributed database system. And that's where we don't want, ideally, the application to know anything about how the data is is split up and divided or replicated across the different nodes in our cluster. So the same SQL query or whatever query language I'm using in my application for my database system, I, if I'm running on one node, I can, that same query should still work and still produce the correct same result if now I'm scared out on a thousand nodes. Because otherwise, if I have a query that says, like, you know, select star statement, and then you have like some special thing that says, you know, where node equals one, two, three, if one, two, three gets now split up across multiple machines or one, two, three goes away, I don't want to go back and rewrite all my, all, all my application code. So we're going to hide all the details from the application where the data is actually being stored. Although we can push some information to the client level at, almost like at a driver to allow it to figure out what node he wants to go talk to. But in our application code, you know, the Joe Schmo programmer should not know anything about how the data is split up, ideally. It's not always the case, but this, this is what we want. So now to talk about how we're going to split the data up, we've already sort of touched on this a little bit. Uh, we're going to use we're going to use partitioning. I think we talked about this as well when we, when we did. Uh, I think it was the the this time one of the timestamp ordering protocols talked about this, and we talked about a little bit of this with with parallel execution. The idea here is that we're going to take our database and split it up into disjoint subsets that we're then going to assign to our, our different different resources. If you're coming from the, the NoSQL world, they're going to call this sharding, but partitions and shards are essentially the, the same thing. So now what's going to happen is the database system is going to get a query, and it's going to look at what data the different parts of that query plan need to access, and then it may potentially need to send fragments of the plan to different nodes to go have them execute that part of the query, and then send back the result uh, that they generated. 
And we can use that same exchange operator we talked about before under the iterator model when we did parallel queries. That same exchange operator is, is how we can parallelize things in a distributed environment. So let's talk about how we actually want to split our tables up. So the most simplest way to do table partitioning uh, is you just take a single table and you have every single node, you have each node store one, one of those tables. So I have three tables, A, B, and C. Node one gets A, node two gets B, and node, node three gets C. That's the easiest way to do partitioning. All right, for this one, obviously, you have to assume that the table can fit on a single node, uh, but for that, it's fine. So I have two tables, one and two. I just take all, again, all the tuples in, in, in table one goes to one partition, all the tuples in table two go to another partition. So the ideal query in this environment is any query that obviously touches one table. Because now I don't need to communicate through between these different nodes. I just send my query to this one node, it runs, and I send back the result. Again, I'll get parallelism, assuming that I, my workload is easily divided across these two, two tables, but we obviously know that's not always the case. That's not realistic. So the only, uh, very few systems will let you do this. I know MongoDB can. MongoDB, you can say, in their world, they call it a collection instead of a table. You can tell MongoDB, store a table on this one, you know, on a single node by itself. But this, uh, this, isn't, this, isn't, this isn't that common in other systems. Yes? Uh, are these the shared nodes or the disks? This question is, what are these partitions? Yeah. Doesn't matter. For simplicity, assume it's shared nothing. Actually, yeah. In, assume it's shared nothing. In a shared disk architecture, you don't have you don't necessarily have fine-grained control like this. You could, because you basically, you could just say in, in, like, in like S3, you just have different buckets for different tables. But you, you don't know any information, you don't have any information on where it's actually being stored. So assume this is shared nothing. What is more common, what most people think about in a distributed database is to do horizontal partitioning. And for us, again, we're assuming we're doing a, a row store system. So for this one, we're going to split the table up row by row by looking at one or more columns as, as the partitioning key and examining the value of those partitioning keys and then deciding what partition to assign it to. So again, in, in a shared disk system, sorry, shared nothing system, you do physical partitioning because every node is going to have actually stored locally on its local disk, it, its partition. And then in a shared disk system, you would do a logical partitioning where you, fit, you assign a compute node to be allowed to access a particular partition so that you know you don't have a copy of the same page across multiple, uh, multiple nodes to reduce the amount of coordination you have to do. So let's look at a simple example like this. So let's say that we select this column as the partitioning key and we're going to do hash partitioning, which is just we're going to scan through and look at the value for every single tuple for this particular column and it's going to hash it, mod by the number of partitions we have, and then that will tell us where, where to actually want to, we want to go send the data. So now if a query shows up and it's like, you know, select start from table where partition key equals some value, we just take that value, run it through our same hash function, and now we know exactly where our partition is. So this is hash partitioning. You also can do range partitioning where you know, which I've shown before, you basically say, you know, this contiguous segment of, of the value space for a column goes to this partition, then the next, you know, 100 keys go to this next partition, and then same thing, the query shows up, you look at the value they're trying to do a lookup on, and I, you know, I, I know where to route the data that, that I want, or go route the query to find the data where I want. Yes? Yes. So her question is, um, the, just, I'm going to rephrase your question. Selecting what partition you key to use isn't actually an NP-complete problem because there's so many different combinations I could do. How do I know what to do? So uh, this is something I actually have done research on. There's, a, there's like a 40, 50 year history of people developing different methods and algorithms to pick the partitioning key. Uh, 
Again, my advisor's advisor wrote one in the 70s, and he's dead. I wrote one, right? Uh, it's basically, it's like a search optimization problem. I look at my workload, I see how I'm accessing my, my queries, uh, my queries are accessing the table, and if I'm seeing this thing, you know, partition key, you know, something equals something over and over again, then that's obviously the one I want to choose. For OOTP applications, oftentimes, you can, we'll talk about this next class, you can almost develop like a tree schema and identify like brand, or pass down to the tree that you then sp split everything up. So for example, like say Amazon divides up uh, its, its, its database based on like state, where the customers are located. So here's all the customers in Pennsylvania, and then here's all the, 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 the orders for the customers in Pennsylvania. Here's all the items that they bought in Pennsylvania. So I can take all of the Pennsylvania uh, customers and put them in, in one partition. All the, the, the Maryland ones go in another partition. So it's a lot of times it's sort of obvious what that key should be. For OTP, for OLAP, it's a bit more tricky. You definitely have to look at the queries, what the queries are, because again, you want to minimize the amount of coordination or data you're sending between the different partitions. Yes? I was just trying to think, say, if we have some index indexing on the same partition key, will it have some impact on this? Design. Your question is, if we have an index on the partitioning key, will this have an impact on the design? I mean, the selection of the partitioning key? What do you mean by design? Like, not selection. How, how will the, like, if, if we have this query come, if this query comes into, you know, and we already have the index, how will it know that which, like, which partition? All right, so his question is, again, we'll get, we'll get there. His question is, this is my query my application sends us. How do I know that where to go, what partition has the data I'm looking for? Like, how does it know that hit, use this hash function to send, send the query? So if it's a heterogeneous system, you could have a front-end query router like a Mongo did. It'd say, oh, I know the sharding key is this thing here, so let me go pick that out of the query, hash this value, and then I say that's where I want to go. If it's a shared nothing system with a homogeneous architecture, you could say, I, I land on P1, P1 says, oh, you want to execute this query, but I don't have this data. P3 has it, so it just routes your query for you. Or it sends your query down here, runs it, and then sends back the result through P1. There's different ways to do this. All right, so I'm showing, showing hash partitioning here, right? We just take the hash value, modify the number of partitions I have, and that tells me where I need to go. What's the problem with this? He says collision, ignoring collision. Assume we have a good hash value. So even if you have to do a sequential scan of 10 nodes, then you have to go to 10 different. So he says, well, yeah. Sequential scan of 10 continuous record. Yeah, so if you're doing hash partitioning, if you have to do a sequential scan, like if, if this is a range predicate instead of a quality predicate, hash partitioning is a bad idea because I can't hash a range, just the same problem with the hash table. Enough, something else. When you update the partition, then you have to deal with cases. So his statement, his question is, or statement is, if I update the partition key, if I, if I instead of partitioning on this column, I partition on this column, I got to move everything around. Yes, but that doesn't happen that often, right? Like, th like think about like your 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 Amazon account ID. That they're not they're not going to say, all right, we're not partitioning on that anymore. We're partitioning on this other thing, your email address. That rarely ever happens. So if you have new partitions, I repartition. Bingo. So he says. If I, have, if I had a fifth partition here, I had that same problem I had when I, we, we were talking about hash tables. Now you see why we have to talk about the single node stuff first. If I had a fifth partition here, now if I rehash all the values and modify five, they're not guaranteed to be the same partitions. I may end up moving the entire database. Everyone might, might be swapping and moving to another location. So that's bad. So we need a way to handle that. Who here has, has ever heard of consistent hashing? Very few, good, okay, perfect. So, consistent hashing was a technique developed in the early 2000s, and the way it basically allows you to do it, it allows you to do incremental updates and removals of partitions in your cluster without having to move everything around. So the way to think about this is that the hashing space is just a ring, zero to one. And so I'm gonna have, say, three partitions, A, B, and C. So the way to think about this is like, if I hash now a key, and I don't mod it by the number of partitions. I just hash it and say, you know, put it between zero and one. Say I land at this point in the ring. 
So then I travel forward going in clockwise motion until I find the node that has the first node that shows up. And that's where I know my data is going to be located. So I hash it, I get a value, put it between 0 and 1, and I know that in between this, you know, from between this and this is A, so the data I want is on A. Right? Same thing over here. I hash 2, I land here somewhere in, in the ring space, and I jump here to go to C. So again, the way that the, the key space for all of these guys is, 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 is from, from, from the, where the partition starts back into the next partition. Right? That's fine. That's not so great. What matters now is that when I add new nodes, again, say I, my distributed database can't keep up with the traffic I'm trying to support, so I want to add new machines and scale out. So let's say I add, I add a new partition here, D. So if I was doing the static hashing technique that I showed in the last uh, slide, then I add now a, a fourth, fourth partition, and I got to re, you know, rehash and mod by four now everybody, and we have to move, potentially move all the data around. But the way consistent hashing works is that I add my guy into the ring here, and now the only thing I need to transfer is whatever C used to have where, where D now is located. So it's just this part here of all the, all the values that are, that are in this partition that would be covered by this part of the ring, I send them down. And everybody else in, in, in my cluster st stays where they are. So I can add new part, you know, get new partitions, and they just update uh, the ring and add their new space in. And likewise, if I take, take a partition away, then anything here just goes up to where, where C was. So what's really interesting about this technique as well is the way they do replication. Again, we'll cover more of this uh, next class, but let's say I want to do a replication factor of three. So for every single in tape tuple I insert into my database, I wanted, it to be, I wanted it to be replicated on three different nodes, or three different partitions. So that way, if one of them goes down, I have two others available for me that, that can serve as a backup, and my database doesn't go down. So now, say I'm replicating A, and I'm, I'm going to replicate it on three nodes. So I have it on A, counts as one, and then two and three. So any write to A, any key that was in A, is also going to be on F and, and B. So now when my query shows up, same thing, I hash this point in the ring, and I can get it from either A, F, or B, and, I'm, and you know, they're, they're, it's guaranteed to be there, assuming you're doing transactions which we'll talk about next class. So this now actually gets into the consistency issue that we, that we sort of glossed over when we talked about transactions before and talked about ACID. Right? If I do a write on A, how do I know that it's been propagated to F and, F, F, F and B? Well, you have to wait until they all acknowledge that they got the right, which could be bad because one of these guys could, could go down while I'm waiting for the acknowledgement and I, I'm stalling. Or I say I don't wait, but now I have this issue where I, I may do a write on A and then immediately try to read that thing on B and I might not see what I expect to see. Again, so this, we'll, we'll cover this more next class, but this is the consistency. This is the C in ACID that I said we were going to gloss over for single node databases, but matters in distributed databases. So consistent hashing is a really cool technique, uh, and it's actually used in some distributed databases. So the, the three most famous ones are uh, uh, Memcached, which is a ca caching service, Cassandra, uh, and DynamoDB. Like DynamoDB, I think, was the, had the first paper discussed uh, an architecture using this. And then at Facebook, the, one of the co-founders of Cloudera, he saw the DynamoDB paper, thought that was a good idea, started building Cassandra at Facebook, Facebook says, I don't, we actually don't need this anymore, and they decided not to use Cassandra, so then they just open sourced it, and put it out there, and then that, people picked it up and started, started making Cassandra actually be you know, a, a quality system. So these are probably the three most, most famous systems that use the consistent hashing technique. All right, so the, we want to talk briefly about what the distinction is between logical partitioning and physical partitioning. So again, the idea is the same, that you have this hash function or range, range function that allows you to divide up the database into disjoint subsets. But under the shared disk system, you have to do logical partitioning because you don't have control over how the data is actually being written to the, the shared disk thing. Right? Amazon controls this. You don't. So basically, the way it works is that you, have a, you assign some portion of the database to these different uh, compute nodes so that, again, the application server knows that if I want to execute a query, here's, here's the machine to go get the, you know, to, to, to run it. Right? Likewise, from down here, he's responsible for, for, for three. 
shared nothing systems are when you, when you do physical partitioning. Again, this is where you have the the each each node is assigned the the the, the partition a, part, a portion of the data that's managed by a partition. So again, same thing. I know how to get the data uh, that I'm looking for from these different nodes. All right, so we have like 10 minutes left, so let's just finish up, and then that'll set us up for, for Wednesday's class. So when we want to start executing transactions, this is when things get hard. And this is when things get expensive. This is why I see her question is, her question before was, oh, doesn't it always make sense to maybe try to scale vertically? Why would you ever want to scale horizontally? There are going to be, just as if there's diminishing returns, if you scale vertically, the hardware can't actually get any better because you just you, you can't buy a machine that gets any, you know, this immediately faster. It also assumes your software can actually scale and it's not going to be pl plagued by con con concurrency bottlenecks and other things. If you now scale out horizontally, then you're also going to have diminishing returns and performance gains because now you're going to end up with what are called distributed transactions. So if I have something that has to update da data on a single node, we know how to do that. We've covered an entire semester about this. And that's going to be the, fast, the, the best case scenario where my transaction that I need to, need to touch data, it's all on a single node. I can run that with ever, without having to coordinate with anybody else. If I need to touch data across multiple nodes, then now I need a way to make sure that if I make a write here and I make a write here, when my transaction says commit, that it actually does commit. Because I still need to make sure that all my changes are atomic and durable, just as, as, just as I was in a single node system. And that's going to get expensive because how do I make sure that if I say I commit, then everyone actually truly commits? So the way we can, we're going to do this is through a, through a transaction coordinator. So you sort of think of this as like a traffic cop for the entire system that allows a way to determine who's allowed to do what uh, and when, when it goes time to commit that everyone agrees that we're actually going to go ahead and commit. So the two different approaches are to centralize or decentralize. A centralized one is where everyone goes to some centralized location that has a complete view of everything going on inside the, inside the system, and then it makes decisions about whether you're allowed to commit. And a decentralized approach where the nodes try to organize themselves and, and make a decision about, yes, we, this, this transaction made these changes, and we're allowed to commit. And we can notify whoever else is involved in the transaction that they, they've committed successfully. So the very first version of one of these transa uh, transaction coordinators was this thing called a TP monitor from the 1970s and 1980s. Nowadays, I think if you, if you look at the Wikipedia article, TP stands for Transaction Processing Monitor. Uh, back in the 70s, they called these things telecom processing monitors because these things were built for like the early, you know, uh, the phone companies back in, back in the day because they were the ones that had most of the traffic and, you know, most of the data. So the... The way to think about this, this TP monitor is that it's this standalone piece of software that everybody has to talk to in order to figure out whether they're allowed to do, do, do certain operations on our distributed database. So the database system itself could be stored across different nodes, and they don't really know that they're actually involved in a, in a distributed transaction or distributed database. If you just take MySQL, whatever single node system you want, run that separately, and then up above you have this TP monitor to allow you to figure out whether you're allowed to do certain things. So it looks like this, right? So we have application server, we have uh, four partitions. So say we have a transaction with such these, uh, these three partitions. So we're gonna begin our transaction by going to the coordinator and say, hey, we wanna we want modify some data at these partitions, we need to acquire the locks for them, are we allowed to do that? And then the coordinator says, well, I know what else is running in the system because everyone has to go through me. Yes, well, I see these locks are available, so I'm gonna assign them to you and then tell you that you, you, you know, you've acquired them. And then now the application server can go to the different partitions, do whatever it is that it wants to do to make the changes it wants to make. Uh, and then when it wants to go ahead and commit, it goes to the coordinator and says, hey, I want to commit. I made these changes, or these partitions. Am I allowed to do this? And the coordinator is responsible for going and communicating with these guys down here and say, hey, I think you know about this transaction because it told me it was going to touch you. Did, did it actually do anything? And then they come back and say, yes, you know, th these changes were, happened, and they're, and they're okay, we're safe to commit. And then, then once, once we, everybody agrees, once the coordinator recognizes that everyone agrees that we can go and commit, we can send back our acknowledgement. Question? Uh, in what scenario would it not be safe to commit to real operate more? This question is, under what scenario would it be not safe to commit? So let's say I violate a, um, you know, integrity constraint here, my transaction aborts. Right? I, I try to insert a duplicate key. 
the coordinator doesn't know what you did. It says, hey, I, just, I want to acquire the locks on these things, and I want to, I want to commit in a distributed fashion. You have to go ask them whether that's allowed, they were allowed to do that. We are locking the whole partition. For simplicity, his question is, are we locking the whole partition? Simplicity, yes. Right, there's a, I think it's like the X8, there's a protocol that allows you to do more fine grain locking. Just stick with partitions, it makes it simple. Okay, so uh, again, there's a bunch of, uh, a lot of the enterprise uh, software vendors sell you something that, that, that is a TP monitor. Oracle has this thing called Tuxedo. IBM sells this thing called TransArc, which actually was a CMU startup. Like the guys that did the AFS stuff in the 80s, they did a startup called TransArc that got bought by IBM, and IBM still sells this. Uh, there's a project, you can't really read the logo, it's called Apache OMID. It was built by Yahoo. Uh, it's, a, it's basically a TP monitor for HBase, uh, a NoSQL system that's actually used by a couple other systems today. So you can build a distributed database without worrying about transactions because you just rely on these guys to figure things out for you. And you just do all the single node stuff that you, that you normally would. What's probably more common is, is to use a centralized coordinator as a middleware, where you have this piece of software that sits between the application server and the database partitions. All queries go through this middleware, and the middleware is responsible for figuring out, oh, this data wants this query wants to touch this data, this partition. So it looks at its 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 you know its its global lock table information about what partitions are there, and it routes the queries as needed for you. So you look like you're talking to a single single node database system through the middleware, but in the back end, it's distributed and broken across these different partitions. So when the commit request shows up for the application server, the middleware does the same thing as the TP monitor does. It communicates with these guys and say, hey, are we allowed to commit? And only when everyone agrees do you, do you then send back the, the acknowledgement. So this, one, this, this approach is actually very, very common. Like Facebook is probably the most famous one. Facebook runs the world's largest MySQL cluster. Uh, and they have a middleware system to do all this routing for you. Google used to do this for, for MySQL and the ads. Um, there's a planet scale that came out of YouTube. But this approach is actually very, very common. You take a, you know, Postgres, MySQL, whatever you know, your favorite single node database system is, and you build this little wrapper there in front of it. eBay did this with Oracle. Uh, it's, it's very common. The other approach is, the last approach is to do centralized coordination where you don't have a coordinator, you don't have a centralized view of what's going on in the system, the application server communicates with some home partition or base partition, some, some master node that's going to be responsible for this given transaction. Other nodes could be master nodes if, if you assume you're a, a homogeneous architecture. So you send all the query requests either to directly to the master node or to individual partitions, it doesn't matter. But it's when you want to go commit, you go to the master node and say, hey, I made these changes, uh, I want to go ahead and commit my transaction. And then it's responsible for communicating with the other partitions and deciding whether you're allowed to commit. And if yes, then you send back the acknowledgement. All right. So the thing that I glossed over is that part of the how do we figure out whether it's safe to commit question. In the previous example, uh, how do you take the locks in this? This question is how do you take the locks? Uh -huh. So it would be. Say again, assume I'm doing lock, locking the whole partition. So when the query shows up, right, you 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 try to acquire the lock at that point. But what about the master? master the, so the master node would only know information and potentially about what partitions you touched. Doesn't know what you did at them, right? And it's response. The application is responsible for saying, "Hey, I couldn't get the lock of this partition. I have to abort my transaction." So you go back to this guy. Hey, say I, I aborted. Alternatively, you just send all the requests to this guy, and he's responsible for farming it out to the different machines. So you essentially end up taking the lock at that also? At the master node? Uh -huh. If you touch data at the master node, sure, yes. OK, so we'll cover this in more detail next class. As, again, it's going to impress upon you, and then you'll think about it and see on Wednesday why, you know, how hard it actually is. Say we're doing two-phase locking, my last example, and say that my nodes are, 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 are over the wide area network. One node is in Pittsburgh, one node is in San Francisco. So at the same time, I have two applications trying to update the database, right? At the very beginning, I get a lock on my, my node here for A, this guy gets the lock on B, but now I wanna 
update, um, this guy wants to update B, the other guy wants to update A, so now I gotta go over to the network and send a lock request to get the, the other lock on the other thing. The other guy is doing the same thing. I'm obviously ending up with a deadlock here. So how do I actually figure out who's actually should, should be allowed to commit? Because again, if I'm doing a decentralized architecture, if I don't have that TP monitor, but even if I do, I may have, not have the fine-grained information about what it, exactly it's doing on each node, because you can't always know what the query is going to do before you actually run it. Uh, someone needs to figure out, I have this wait for graph of the cycle, I need to kill somebody. And then so let's say this guy says, oh, I'm going to back off. I, I have a deadlock. If I'm doing doc prevention, I kill myself. This guy could be doing the same thing. So this is what we're going to talk about on, on Wednesday. How do you actually do distributed concurrent control? How do you, how do you figure out, you know, take two-phase locking, timestamp ordering, and run it in a distributed environment where you don't have a complete global view of everything that's going on inside the system at any, any given time. We're also going to spend time on when my transaction says go ahead and commit, how do I guarantee that I, that I, that I commit everywhere? Because what happens if a node goes down while I'm trying to commit? What should I do? That's actually super hard to get right. So, if you're interested in these kind of things, there's this great, uh, there's this great website called the Jepson Project by this guy called Kyle Kingsbury. So he was, he's basically, he, he built this torture chamber for distributed databases, written in Clojure, which is a bit gnarly, but he basically has this, this test suite where he can take your distributed database, run through these weird edge cases, and identify that it's not always correct and has, and has, has problems on a, a, a guaranteeing reliability or availability or correctness of transactions. So right now, he, he has a consultant company. People pay him money to go actually run this. So if you go to his website, he has these write-ups, which are super, uh, super detailed and take a long time to read to understand what he's actually talking about. But he talks about how these different data systems he's tried this against they claim that they're, they do transactions correctly. They claim that they can always support high availability or good performance. And his thing shows that they, they, they don't. So they pay him money to go run his thing on their, on their database system. And then if they pass, they can announce that they're certified. So there's one database company, it was Aerospike, which is a distributed key value store. They used to claim on their website they had, you know, they had strong consistency guarantees. He ran his thing against theirs, crushed it, showed how it wasn't. And they had to go back and change all the marketing crap to remove it because he, he humiliated them. So his website's awesome. His Twitter feed, not so much. You'll see why if you go look at it. Uh, it's not my thing. But he's, 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 a, he's a really sharp dude, and I, I think that it's a really good website. All right, next class. Distributed OTP systems, replication, cat theorem, and then real-world examples. Again, we'll go through, start worrying about how we're actually going to run transactions in a distributed environment. We'll talk a little about NoSQL systems and see why they don't want to do transactions, uh, because it's going to affect performance and availability. Okay? All right, guys, awesome. See you on Wednesday. Oh, yeah, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cents for a case, give me St. Nas blue. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up cans, met the gals in the jam, oh, how dry I It's with St. Nas in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the wallaby champs? Stressed out, could never be sun. Rick and say jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam. The boys in the bushes. Crack the bottle of the St. I sip it through those who don't realize the drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive, keep my people still alive. And if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.